You're listening to Girls with Grafts, a burn community podcast created by Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, a leading nonprofit dedicated to supporting the burn community. In this podcast, we'll talk with burn survivors, share resources to help with supporting and improving burn recovery, and discuss how to prevent burn injuries. Here are your hosts, burn survivors and Phoenix Society's marketing team, Amber Wilcox and Rachel Kudlak. Hello and welcome back to Girls with Graphs. I am Rachel Kudlak. I'm one of your co-hosts and I'm joined today by my co-host, Amber Wilcox. Hi, how is everyone today? It's so good to be here for another exciting episode and I'm so excited um, to introduce our guest today. Um, I think she has a lot to bring to our community and so I I can't wait to get started, Rachel. I'll let you kick it off. Yes, I'm so excited. So today, we I'm so happy to welcome Rebecca Allay today to the podcast. She received her BA in Mental Health and Human Services from Francis, Franciscan University in 1983, and then her BA in Occupational Therapy in 1985 from Eastern Michigan University. Rebecca has been a burn rehab therapist at MedStar Washington Hospital Center for 37 years. She works with patients across the continuum of care from the burn ICU to the outpatient setting and throughout aftercare programming. She works closely with MedStar's laser program, assessing and treating scars for years post-injury. She is also a Phoenix OR coordinator and enjoys teaching social skills training and an overview of burn rehabilitation to new nurses. Rebecca also volunteers at the DC Firefighter Burn Foundation, providing aftercare programming, including local outdoor events, taking patients annually to the Adaptive Sports Center in Colorado for a week of outdoor programming, organizing burn retreats, and taking burn survivors to Phoenix World Burn Congress. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. Yes. Rebecca, so I want to get right in and talk a little bit about um, how you get started in the healthcare field, but specifically um, burn care. Would you be willing to share a little bit today about um, how you kind of got started? Sure, absolutely. Um, I went to Eastern Michigan University is where I got my degree in occup- occupational therapy. And at the end of our coursework, we do six months of internships. The first three months, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and the final month that I was there, they said that I could either work with a hand surgeon or work on the burn unit, and I had had a one-hour lecture on burns in school, but it had kind of intrigued me, so I said, you know, I I don't know if I can do it, but let let me try burns, and I still to this day can picture the first patient that I worked with, and um, she was this really remarkable woman who had sustained a fairly large burn. And I went in, got all gowned up and went into the ICU to just do range of motion with her. And it was just kind of one of those really cool life experiences where I just absolutely loved it. And I just felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. And so I loved that month being on burns at, uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And then I came out to Baltimore to do my psych in, up in, um, in Baltimore at uh, Shepherd Pratt Hospital, and I was up there for three months. And towards the end of that, I I sent a letter to about 20 burn units around the country. And I said, I'm a new grad. I want to specialize in burns. Are you willing to hire somebody? And so anyway, I heard from MedStar right away and came down and interviewed, and they hired me on the spot. So I've been here ever since. That's awesome. So it was really that first you know, experience that kind of got just handed to you during, you know, when you're still in school, finishing up. And since then, you've been hooked to the burn care field. Yes, I have been. Um, I feel like most of us who are in burn care um, just really love it. I mean, I feel like the burn teams are are people that really feel drawn to this working with burn patients and, and really find it incredibly rewarding and fulfilling. So yes, I have have very much enjoyed my time in the burn community for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what what would you say is the toughest part about working in you know burns and the field? And I mean, even today, maybe this is a two part answer of today's healthcare environment as well. Mm-hmm. 
Um, well, I think, you know, the probably the greatest challenge working on a burn unit is just that as, as a therapist, what we are doing with the patients causes them at least discomfort, if not significant pain. Mm -hmm. And so it it's really a challenge to, I think for us as therapists to form a relationship with the patient so that they will really trust us and allow us to guide them and teach them and work with them through um, through their rehabilitation so that they will allow us to, you know, to really push them to stretch their skin, even when it's really painful. Um, so it's challenging because the patient is in pain a lot of the times, and that's really hard to see. But but I feel like when we feel confident that what we're doing is going to benefit you and this is going to give you the best outcome. Um, the challenge then is to us, I think, as therapists to really form that relationship so that we can work well together. Yeah. And I think what is difficult today is that so many, um, oftentimes, you know, just the amount of care that we can give is sometimes limited by, you know, do they have insurance coverage? We, we, everybody gets the same excellent care when they're in the hospital, but then what they're able to have beyond, beyond that depends on their coverage. And so we do have people that we would love to follow more regularly and we're not able to um, because they have limited coverage. And, and that's, that's hard to see. So, you know, funny that you say that, Rebecca, because I know for myself, um, my husband and I did home health care for quite some time, um, but mm -hmm. there was a point where I could have one or the other. I wasn't allowed to have both. So thankfully, my husband could do my home health care. But in terms of like being able to get the therapy that I needed, like the physical therapy that I needed or occupational, um, that was more valuable to me because of the, the, you know, what I needed at that time. Like I had a harder time forcing myself to do those stretches and things that I really needed, whereas my husband could do what I, what I needed for me. So it, it, it stung to have to be forced into making a decision of which one is more valuable to me, you know, how my range of motion or getting my wounds healed. And had I not had my husband here, like that probably would have been an issue for me for sure. Yes. Um, but it's funny because I, to this day also, as much as you remember your first patient, I remember like my occupational therapist mm. because of how like wonderful they were and they knew exactly what I needed. Right. So whether they were providing me with the tough love um, and I always <laughs> came in with like the jokes and um, almost I was rude sometimes because I was just so angry at them, but they kind of gave it right back to me. And so that um, to this day, we just, we still <laughs> laugh at them. They come and see me every time I'm visiting in the, you know, the outpatient clinic. And so right. I had a special relationship with, with my occupational therapist and my therapist specifically because of, you know, how much they truly meant to me. Like we joked and all of that, but like, that was what got me back to doing what I loved. And so I think it takes a very special person to know exactly what they, they need to build those right relationships. So I very right. much value what you do. Um, <laughs> but what would you say? Um, I know I always went in with a thousand questions, right? So, um, especially for my occupational team, like, I, you know, I never, I called it the figure four stretch where I put my foot on my knee and I always was like afraid that I would like let my graft fall off or something. So I <laughs> asked a million questions always, but what would you say is like the most common one that you get from survivors in burn care? The most common what? I'm sorry. The common like question. So what do you get in terms of questions? Would you say there's one question you get more than others? Oh gosh, I think, you know, how how long until I'm, I can feel like I'm kind of over the hump, you know? How how long mm -hmm. do things normalize a little bit? How long do I have to wear these compression garments? Um I think that I think that patients and, and I don't know if this was your experience, but I think that patients are shocked early on when they find out, okay, this isn't just a two week thing here. You know, I mm -hmm. think long-term effects of a burn injury are always a surprise to people. And, and I, oh, there's a part of me that kind of dreads that, that conversation in the hospital early on where you, you do, is you want to give them a really clear idea of what's going to play out for them as far as length of time for healing, for scar maturation, for regaining motion. Um, and it, it's not a, we always say it's a marathon. This is not a sprint. And 
I think people are used to other types of injuries that heal so quickly and then you're just done with it, you know, and the mm-hmm. burn is different in that way. So, so I feel like that's, that's the conversation that people want to have. And then it, they always just say, Oh my gosh, I had no mm-hmm. idea. That this, Rebecca, yeah. It's funny you say that because uh, Jane Fair, who was on this podcast not too long ago uh-huh. and uh, was treated at MedStar, Um, Mm -hmm. that is her least favorite question that she got an answer (laughs) to while she was treated there, but she's most known for giving the answer to that question now, because I think it was most shocking to her. So anytime I think of that question, I think of Jane, um, and if you haven't watched her episode, I recommend it for sure. But, uh, yeah, that was Jane. It's Jane's to this day, like most hated and most loved (laughs) question because there's no straight answer to, to that question as a, you know, as you're recovering in burn care. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, and I think too, a lot of times you get so focused on just going home and that first, mm-hmm. you know, leaving the hospital, we hear that from survivors. And while that's definitely something to celebrate and it is a victory of leaving the hospital, you think it's done then, but it's not. It's just right. the next phase of the recovery. It's not anywhere near done in most situations. So it's, it's bittersweet um, for yeah. sure. And, and I, do you, go ahead. No, I was going to ask another question. So go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, I, I do feel like people often will come back to that first outpatient appointment and and they will share, okay, on one hand, yes, it was great to get home. But on the other hand, I'm home and I can't do the things I used to do or things mm-hmm. have changed. You know, Everybody's role in the family has changed or there's just so much that's not kind of what it used to be that that going home is a real mix of emotion and, and um and just a, in an experience in general, it's the, I think the excitement, uh, the reality sets in pretty quickly after mm. the excitement. Whereas Rebecca, that- I can't tell you how much I resonate that with that because I was in the hospital for a, a remarkably short time, time during COVID. And I remember my husband and I, you know, ringing that bell as we leave the burn unit and we're so excited and we get home and, and, you know, two days in, we look at each other and like, what were we thinking? Like, why were we excited to leave? But I remember my husband, my husband had me um, like didn't have me move. Right. So he was like, you stay on the couch. I'll get you a drink. I'll get you whatever you need. Like you sit there and rest. Well, um, about a week later, I went into the burn unit and my occupational therapist told me I was walking like Donald Duck and um, just kept making fun of me because she said I look like a duck. Well, it was because I wasn't practicing walking. I like wasn't like moving towards strides. And so she actually yelled at my husband and said, like, (laughs) you should not be doing everything for her. But it was really hard to make that adjustment to home to think like she he knew I was hurting and knew that things were like tough. But sometimes it was really tough to give that like tough love in that moment. But um, seeing like what would happen if I didn't like go through that like tough Mm -hmm. love and get what I needed and whatnot during that time. So yes, it's I think it's super important to to remember that because even though we're hurting, it was like necessary for me at that time to, to kind of do what my doctor said and, and continue to right to heal in that way. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And what what questions do you get? And maybe they're the same, but from like loved ones or you know friends or caregivers that are coming with the survivors, do they have any surprising questions or common questions that you hear a lot? I I think that. Most of the conversations with loved ones and family members are their concern that is the is the burn survivor really telling us how what a hard time they're having. So a lot of times it's hard for people to really say how hard things are, especially I think even with the whole emotional piece. A lot of mm-hmm. patients will say that. In the hospital, you're so focused on the physical recovery and, you know, there's the pain and there's the wound healing and trying to get closure of the wounds. And then they go home and that's when they begin to realize the emotional impact of the injury. And so maybe they tend to get a little more depressed or or angry or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever, dependent on the circumstances. And so I feel like for the family members, they they do obviously want to know, are are we doing the dressings right? Does everything look like it should? Um, but then I feel like they often will take us aside and it's that conversation of, I, I heard him tell you that he's doing pretty well, but I don't think he is, you know, and mm-hmm. you kind of try and get him to open up or, you know, that type of thing. So mm-hmm. and I think it's just that 
family concern, again, not really knowing what the person is experiencing and, and just wanting them to, to heal and recover physically, you know, and emotionally. And, and um, families often mm -hmm. see the, the most difficult aspect of what the person is experiencing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I know for me too, I definitely didn't always tell the truth to my healthcare team, partially because I didn't want to be at the hospital any longer. So I would say, yeah, I'm doing fine. Or it, do it doesn't hurt. It's not itchy just because I wanted to go home. Right. Um, so right. I, I can see why, you know, even just in general, opening up to someone you, you're not as familiar with is definitely harder than a family right. member or a loved one. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know we've been talking about some of these tougher conversations that you have to have, but what are some of the f best parts of your job? What's your favorite part of your, your job? Oh, gosh. Um, well, my favorite part is definitely just establishing the relationship with the patient and, you know, coming alongside them at a really, obviously, a traumatic, difficult time. And it it's... It's great on one hand that that having done this as long as I have, that that I can look at somebody's burn injury and I, I can have some sense of, you know, what this is going to be like in four months, six months, twelve months, and and a lot of times, you know, just being able to offer that encouragement, you know, your wounds are going to heal. We are going to, we we can if you let me work with you. If you, you know, will do the exercises and, and work closely with us, you will regain your motion. Um, those kinds of encouraging conversations are, are fun. Um, I also just, I really enjoy some of the tougher conversations too, um, as a patient's getting ready to go home and really asking them, you know, taking that time to sit down with them for 15, 20 minutes and just really say, What's your biggest concern when you think about going home? Um, what are what are you feeling anxious about? And I feel like most times patients will open up about that. And and then again, if somebody particularly has bandages or scarring with that's very visible, either their face, their hands, their arms, that type of thing, and just really, I like to be very direct with them and just say, I, I want you to know, just from so many former patients have shared with me that, you know, people are going to stare at you. Um, I want us to have this conversation so that you feel comfortable um, or, or more comfortable um, and have been intentional about preparing for that. And those conversations of just preparing for, for being out in public again are incredibly rewarding. I think mostly because it's something they haven't felt comfortable bringing up themselves but I think that they've been thinking about it and then they are just so appreciative, you know, thank you so much for talking with me about this. And, and um, you can see them kind of gain a little more comfort and a little more confidence as you have those conversations. And so people are, I continue to be amazed at how resilient and um, I, I just feel like it's amazing to me how, how strong individuals can be in, in recovering from an injury like this. And, and it's, it's really feels like a privilege to be part of, part of their journey and part of helping them um, along their path. So. I think that's important because I know as a survivor, like I didn't want you to sugarcoat it. Right. So what you were just saying about telling them like going out in public, like, I want you to shoot me straight and just tell me how it is. Right. If, if I'm walking funny, I want you to tell me I'm walking funny. I don't want you to kind of sugarcoat those things. And I think um, that was really important to me was the honesty of like giving me the facts and, and, um, and really just kind of leading with in my experience, because um, that was really, really important to me to not have things sugar coated. And maybe oh. at the time, I didn't always love it. You know, I'll remember, um, I had a vacation planned, <laughs> like a couple months down the road. And I remember my doctor coming in and just saying, like, don't plan on it, it's not going to happen. And I was devastated, but also like appreciative that they didn't try to sugarcoat like what my recovery would look like. Right. Um, but I think that's really important as a, you know, healthcare professional. I don't want, I don't want those sugar coatings. I want like the, the straight answer. Um, 
And so I think that that's a tough conversation to have. And it's, it takes a lot of resiliency for you to be able to have those conversations as well. Um, with that said, I know you are part of the Phoenix Soar family. So you are trained to have those types of conversations. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your SOAR um, hospital program and maybe why you'd recommend it to other burn units that don't have it yet? Um, so what do you love about the SOAR program? Yeah. So the SOAR program is, is I think, such a gift for patients because, as so many people have said, you know, the, the family members, burn team members can offer support to a patient but there's nothing like actually talking to somebody who knows what it's like to have a burn injury and have a skin graft and, you know, be, be in the same place that they are. And so I do think that it's really valuable um, when we, when we can offer it, that we can offer to people um, talking with somebody who has, has been a burn patient and, is at least a year, if not more, post-injury to just kind of give them encouragement. Um, it's it's interesting to me how many people are hesitant about that in the hospital. Um, and I, I do feel like a lot of sore training or sore um, connections take place further out from the burn injury. Um, I feel like the, the best, the best program that we had, which was pre-COVID, um, we had a SOAR volunteer who would come in and she would she would actually just go to each patient's room and she would give them a, a handout basically that said what aftercare programs we offered and that peer support um, was one of those, you know, was something that's available to you. And she would, she felt like doing that and just kind of getting in the room and making that connection and introducing herself did help people just be more open in the hospital to, to um, actually talking to a, a peer supporter. But, um, but it it's, seems like it's very much a personality thing. It's very much the intensity of the pain that they're experiencing. Um, I, I have had patients literally say to me, I don't, I don't want to, talk to other people who are burned. I don't really want to be in the gym and see other people who are burned. Um, I think it is just the whole process of, of the reaction to the injury and to whatever the traumatic event was that caused the injury is just such an individual um, individual experience that, that everybody you know, is different in that some people aren't ready for that. But for people that are really like, you know, we have people who will say, yes, I want to talk to somebody. Like, can they come today? And um, and that is just, it's, it's awesome to have that, to offer to them. It's not something that we had years ago. And I am very appreciative of the fact that it's just one more, um, it's one more way that we can support our patients and help them um, as they're recovering. So, a peer support program is, gosh, I, I just can't recommend it enough to anybody that doesn't offer that at this point. Um, I think it is a valuable um, gift to give to patients to have available to them for sure. Yeah. Um, I know that you brought up aftercare as well, Rebecca. So if they can't write or don't want to connect right away, it's really important to just, I love the belief behind because yes, even though they're not ready right away, maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of months down the road, they'll have that flyer and go, oh, you know, this is something I could maybe start to join. <laughs> right. Well, and I think too, for burn units to the importance of af offering aftercare um, in a lot of different avenues is because that peer support happens whenever you get a group of, of burn survivors together. So even if it's not an, an intentional, you know, this is a one-on-one -on -one peer support um, session, that bringing people together at a burn retreat or bringing people together for a hike or, you know, for whatever different, different units have all different types of aftercare programming, but just gathering, gathering burn survivors together so that they can start talking and, and become comfortable um, expressing where they are in their recovery and, and getting support from others is so valuable. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. And the great thing today, even, though it came from COVID is there are so many ways to get that peer support, whether it is 
a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a group setting, or, you know, mm -hmm. we have our weekly chat. So you don't even have to be on camera. Um, just having so many different ways to get peer support is so important. Just going back to what you said of everyone is different. Every injury is different. Um, your comfort level is different. So it's great now, at least today, though, that we have so many different ways of giving peer support. Yes. Yeah. And I think what you all have done at the Phoenix Society through COVID has, has been really meaningful and has met the needs of a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. I mean, more than ever during COVID because our, our um, support, peer support group um, shut down and we weren't able to have people come into the hospital, our peer supporters. And, and we did some over the phone um, and some by video, but, but more than ever, we were just making sure that everybody was connected to you all and really, mm -hmm. did, you know, they have multiple avenues where you can, can connect with people. And, and that's where I think the Phoenix Society is just so good at helping burn units to just meet the needs of our patients. And um, you guys do a great job of that. Thanks. I think yeah. it's so important, Rebecca, with what you said about just gathering, right? Because I know I don't always want to join support and just talk about my burns, even like you know, however many years out, I think sometimes it's nice to just connect. Um, Rachel's another survivor as well. So when the two of us get together, it's just nice to be able to know like, okay, this person gets it. I don't have to explain mm -hmm. it. Like I can still connect with you on a personal level, but I don't always want to talk about my injury mm -hmm. and what happened. And there may be a time and a place for that, but I've been to some retreats and events and just being able to connect with other people that had those same life experiences that don't have to kind of be have explained like that the trauma that I went through is right. really important. So I love that you encourage units to do that too. Cause I think um, I've taught for UC Davis, like yoga classes or things where I can gather with other um, survivors in one setting. And I think that's super important um, rather than not just like an addition to peer support, having opportunities for me to connect. Cause what you just said, like peer support happens whether you like it or not, when, when you get a group of people together, um, they're going to start talking about those things. So I love mm -hmm. that you said that because I think that's super important. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Definitely. Well, I do want to dive into the Phoenix World Burn Congress, but I do want to ask you one more question before we get into that. Mm -hmm. um, you've been at MedStar for 37 years, which is amazing. What advice would you give to a new, you know, burn therapist or burn nurse or just any provider in the burn field entering right now? What advice would you give them? Gosh. Um, my, I think my first advice would be to take the time to really get to know your patients. To just take that extra five minutes, you know, for nurses, I know they've got a lot going on, particularly on the ICU and whatnot, but just to take that extra five minutes and to ask them how they're doing to really, you know, after they've just had a, a post-op dressing taken down and everyone else has left the room, ask the patient, how are you feeling about how that looks? Um, taking that time to be intentional about really trying to connect with, with our patients. I think that and you alluded to this, Amber, just in your relationship with your OTs and PTs. But I find that patients years out um, can definitely say, this is the person on the burn team who made a difference for me. This is either the nurse or the therapist or somebody on the team. And that person connected with me and helped me make it through this whole process. And so... Um, so I feel like that's always my biggest encouragement is... is get to know, really take the time and be intentional about getting to know your patient and form a relationship with them. Um, and then honestly, my second piece of advice would be you have got to get involved with either going to World Burn Congress, um, going to a burn retreat, doing an aftercare program, something, because you you really will, will grow so much professionally and personally if you see the long view, if you can get a really long view of what it's like to recover from a burn injury. And, and again, that really incorporates then understanding and gaining more insight into the emotional impact. And mm. I, I think that it's it's too easy in medicine to, to just focus on what's right in front of you at the moment. And um, I think that as 
nurses as OTs and PTs, I think that we can just start having some of those conversations or make it at least make it easy for a patient to say, this is what's going on inside of me. And if they can start articulating where they are emotionally, I think it just, to me, that just is another opportunity for that healing and that acceptance to begin um, sooner than later. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. Yeah. Getting to, or having that experience, right. With other survivors, because you see them initially, but then you never, sometimes never see them again, right. After Mm -hmm. that. And so, but I can tell you, yes, I, I can confirm, like, not just my OTs, but like the nurses that we remember the names of, and my husband and I still to this day, like, can, can tell you full stories about what happened. And the ones, I have this one nurse that came in for five minutes and talked to me about watching Tiger King. And he got me <laughs> to watch Tiger King. And to this day, his name is Joey, and he's one of my nurses, but he, um, we connected on that because he was like kind of joking with me. Like, you have to watch this. You have to watch it. And then that day he would come in and check on me and be like, where are you at in the episode? And it was just because he like cared enough to kind of get to know. I told him I liked reality TV and he had mm-hmm. kind of gotten into like really getting to know me as a person. And then we connected on something special that I trusted him. Right. So I remember later that day I was saying, I'm not feeling great. The medication I'm on. And like, I was willing to tell him that because I trusted him because we had built that really good relationship. Mm-hmm. And so I think, um, I don't think it always happens. Right. Like I've also had the opposite of that where nurses that don't want to connect with me and are there to do their job and leave, but it can be really hard for me to trust you when you haven't shown a piece of a piece of yourself. So I think that's, that's really important that you share that because yes, you're right. I, I remembered the people that, (laughs) that just took that five minutes out of their day. Yes. Yeah. And I feel like patients will often say that, I mean, they'll, they, they pick up on, you know, this nurse, it it just, they seem like they don't realize that I'm a human being, but I am. And I've got a whole story outside of this place. And and so, yeah, Yeah. I agree with with everything you're sharing. Yeah, I absolutely. And I think that's, they think that we can't always tell, but I can tell, I can tell if you're having a bad day. I can tell if you're having a good day. So, um, (laughs) Rebecca, um, so you work at one of our Phoenix World Burn Congress partners of MedStar Health. Mm-hmm. Um, which is very local to the conference this year. Um, and you've been to past, you know, events. Um, can you tell us maybe a story about your favorite event or what's your favorite part of the event um, that you can share with our audience? Mm, gosh. Um, that's hard. I, I love the whole experience. Um, I always say it is the most inspiring uh, three days ever. Um it's, it's, it's everything from the simpleness of sitting in that um, banquet hall and having, what do we have, 800, 900 people that come to the Congress mm-hmm. and, and just the, the support that's present, the sense of acceptance that's, that's there. And, and I think as a therapist, I, I, can look around at everybody and and just to recognize all of these people have had a really challenging, difficult, painful injury, and they and and that's even in addition to whatever event caused the injury, right? I mean, a lot of times the trauma traumatic event that caused the injury is is in a category all of its own, and so just it's inspiring to just to think of all the the perseverance, the, um, the resilience, the hard work of recovery that has taken place in this group of people. And, and that in and of itself to me is, is incredibly inspiring. And just, um, you know, you feel privileged to be a part of that. Um, the open mic where people do stand up and, and share part or all of their story, that is, is incredibly um, moving. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, the, the talks are just, um, I, I just feel like you, you learn so much. It just, it deepens your understanding of everything from, you know, post-traumatic stress to, you know, whatever, whatever the topic is, how do you get back out there in public? Um, all the, the different avenues of, of the physical 
aspects of recovery as well as the emotional. Um, it is just, it's a wealth of information that is shared and that is taught, I think, at World Burn. And, and then seeing people just really, to, you know, to come there and, and be nervous and be overwhelmed. And I don't know if I really should be here, but somebody told me I should. And, <laughs> and over the days, you just see them kind of blossom, you know, and, and you can see them forming relationships with other people and, and being validated in what they're experiencing and, and, and talking with others who've had similar experiences. It, it's just, um, it's just inspiring. It's just really, really inspiring. And for so many of our patients who we've taken to World Burn Congress, they they do just say it's absolutely life changing. I mean, just the, the powerful experience of being with that many people um, who they can identify with, and mm -hmm. it just is. It's it's really incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't wait until October. I'm so excited to go to the conference this year and be together just in person as a community. Mm -hmm. I know so many people are looking forward to it as well. Um, and I know you wanted to share a little bit about your first experience at World Burn Congress, which I think you yes. said it was in New York that year. Yes, yes. I did want to share that. Um, I guess particularly if, if any other um, burn therapists or nurses or anybody listens to this, because um, it was incredibly life-changing for me professionally and, and even personally, I would say. But I think it was about 15 years ago. I don't remember the exact year, but it was up in New York City. And prior to that time on the burn unit, I mean, I'd already been here many years. And, but our focus was very much if we could get patients back to work and independent in their self-care, that basically we had been successful in our rehabilitation of them. And we, we took that seriously. And I mean, we really tried to do a good job of that, but, um, but we, we were not keyed into the emotional um, impact of the injury at all. So uh, Jason Woods and Jimmy DeGregory are two DC firefighters who had started the DC Firefighter Burn Foundation. And they called me and they said, hey, we're, we're gonna go up to New York to this conference. How about if you pull together a group of patients to go? I had heard about the Phoenix Society, but I knew nothing. I mean, I was beyond ignorant, I hate to say. <laughs> um, but so anyway, I said, well, sure, I can I can pull together some patients. So so we went up and the first session that I went to was Barbara Quayle's, um, that afternoon session <laughs> where she does the whole social skills training and, and talks about, about um, getting back out there in, in public. And I sat in that session with probably, oh, I don't know, 40 other people or so. And I was completely blown away because everything she was saying, I just realized that it, it was not even on my radar screen. And I could think of so many patients who I had worked with over the years who I had made transparent face masks for them. I had, you know, made different neck splints and everything to try and give them the best outcome and control scarring and remodeling scarring and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I had definitely, you know, befriended them. I had been compassionate towards them, but I had never, I realized I had never asked them, what is this like for you? I had never really, you know, I certainly had not prepared them for when I never said to them at that point, you know, people are going to stare. I want to help you be prepared for that. I had never prepared them for leaving the hospital. I had never asked them really a more in-depth personal question of how they were doing emotionally regarding their healing. And I, I was just absolutely um, blown away by the whole presentation that Barbara did. And at the end, I had so many questions for her, but I honestly, I just felt like I can't even go up and talk to her because if I open my mouth, I think I'm <laughs> weeping and I will never stop because I felt I, I could just picture so many patients that I felt like I didn't give them what they needed. And it was absolutely, um, you know, kind of devastating to be honest as I sat there. Well, then throughout the rest of the conference, 
I was very intentional. Any opportunity where I felt like it wasn't too awkward, I would um, go up to a burn survivor and introduce myself. And I would say I'm an OT from DC and I'm just trying to, to understand more of what you all experience. And, and so I would say to people who had obvious face burns and I would say, did you wear a face mask? And most of them would say yes. And, and then I would ask them, I said, what, how did you do it? Like, what made you do it? How did you put that mask on mm-hmm. day after day? Like, help me understand this. And what was amazing is that so many of them said to me, I did it for my therapist. I did it because my therapist told me I needed to, and I trust my therapist, and I did it for my therapist. And that, again, I was like, oh, my gosh, really? Like, and. And so it was this amazing experience of I came away from that first World Burn Congress and I I felt like, number one, I have completely neglected the emotional impact of this injury up until this point. And so I, I felt like I that was now something I was beginning to understand and would totally change the way I interacted with patients. And then also just realizing, I think the, the value of that therapist patient relationship and mm-hmm. that they really they really do value the input that we have and that we really are at a place to make a difference in in how they're handling things and in their recovery and um so it it was just it was fabulous i mean it it was an amazing experience i think that as i said earlier it, listening to these people's stories during open mic and just even in conversations you have with people, you do get a sense of the the long view of recovery that mm-hmm. you get just in the hospital. And so I, I, every time I speak somewhere, I tell therapists and nurses, you have got to go to World Burn. It will, mm-hmm. will change you. It will make you a better surgeon. It'll make you a better nurse. It'll make you a better therapist. Whatever your role is, you will become much more skilled and much more compassionate and and mm. make a bigger impact with your patients if you if you go to this conference. I love that you just are able to say that, right? <laughs> I didn't be able to share that with the world because I think um, there's, you know, I, in my opinion, there, there are some folks that maybe don't feel like they always, you know, need to continue to learn from that. And I think that's really important. I can tell you, I feel like every doctor and nurse out there in the world, whether you're in burn care or not, should also go because I've had um, some really horrible experiences outside of that. Like, mm-hmm. like I've had wonderful, I've been blessed with wonderful nurses and doctors in the burn care space. But when you look at the like outside of burn care of how to talk to somebody who's had that injury or really... Yeah many of them don't have an understanding of even what the injury is um, mm-hmm. and or how to react to it. Um, like if I go to a primary care or something, I just have had very different experiences um, with that. And so I wish always there's more education out there in, in the world after that, right? So that I knew how to interact with even healthcare providers who just have literally never seen something that looks like me before. So um, I think it's really, really hard. And I, I give you credit for acknowledging that you had more to learn and um, I think that's really, really big and important because I do agree that I think everybody can take away. I know even just having been in the unit, my husband and I took so much away just from the small interactions we'd had, had with other survivors because mm-hmm. no one survivor story is, is the same. So I think that's super important. <laughs> um, so Rebecca, you are on the PWBC programming committee. Um, what made you, and I think I know the answer to this based on what you just gave us, but <laughs> what made you uh, want to join the committee and really, um, can you share more about that involvement of what you're doing behind the scenes to help with yes. making this next event um, such a success? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think there was honestly a part of me that at, at all the world burns I've been to, I think I've kind of sat there at some point and during the week and thought, what is it like planning this? Like, <laughs> who does it and how long does it take them? And so just a little bit of curiosity. Um, it's always so well planned and it runs so smoothly. And so I, I did, I have to say, I had a little bit of curiosity just what this what this experience would be like. Um but then I think to, I think in some ways I, I definitely wanted to, to be part of 
what are the topics going to be and and who do we think would address those well and mm -hmm. and i think some of that comes from um and i shared this in one of our meetings recently that in our planning meetings but you know, I, I have worked with a lot of firefighters, a lot of DC firefighters who have um, had burn injuries. And at one of the recent world burns a number of years ago, anyway, that one of some of them made the comment that they just said, we need more meat. We need more. We need a deeper understanding of why we're having the problems we're having. Like, why do I still, you know, react this way? Why do I get so triggered? Why, you know, what is going on inside of me? And so I think um, there was a part of me that just thought, you know what, I want to, I, I want to be able to, to give input to the committee as far as things that I hear survivors say their needs are, mm -hmm. and um, and just kind of help frame that a little bit. And and I would say that has been very much the experience. It's a it's a great a great group of people, and, and Megan does such a great job organizing all of us and keep our keeping the trains running. <laughs> um, but no, it's been it's been fun to get that. I know Phoenix Society had put out um, on the website people could sign up who were interested in, mm -hmm. in speaking or being involved, and so we totally went through all of that, you know, all of those people, all their bios, everything they gave us to, to just kind of see where do people fit in and and what are the topics that really are important to, to have addressed. And um, and it's a great, I mean, it's a great group of, of burn survivors and healthcare professionals who are in burns and, mm -hmm. and even a couple firefighters on the committee. And, and it's exciting. It's really, it's really, just a lot of fun to see this come together. And I think that we have some great um, sessions planned and, you know, we're not totally finalized with everything yet, but we're getting a lot closer. And so it, it definitely builds, like even you were saying, Rachel, how excited you are for October. I think being on the committee even builds that excitement more because you're kind of mm -hmm. like, this is what we envisioned. This is what we talked about. This is what we're hoping for people to have and, um, and just, working through that with such a great group of people is mm -hmm. definitely a fun experience. That's awesome. Yeah. And we're so happy to have you on the committee and I've been hearing things from Megan and the committee has been so great this year. So I'm sure it'll put like an extra added bonus for you when you're at the conference this year, because you got to help behind the scenes with yeah. it. But is there one particular, you know, event or anything that you're really looking forward to um, for the conference this year? Mm. Um, I don't, I don't know that we're disclosing any, any names or anything, but the, I won't do that. But the, the, <laughs> the keynote speaker that first night is going to be, I think, really excellent. And I think, um, I think he's going to really just inspire a lot of people and be very well received. I'm very excited about that. And we do have, um, a couple Burn psychologists who are giving talks at learning sessions that I think are going to be really just super informative and also offering some tools for people to really mm -hmm. take away and, and help in their recovery. And I think that's going to be really meaningful to people. I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a really fabulous Congress, I do. And it is a great setting. It's a, it's a beautiful setting. There's a lot to do right there. And then if people want to take the water taxi or whatever and go into the into DC proper, they can do that. Um, I, I personally love DC. So <laughs> well, speaking of that, one of my questions for you, Rebecca, um, yeah. you, you beat me to it would be, um, you're obviously native to the DC area. So um, what would be your like go-to site, whether it's um, like a, somewhere to, to go hang out at or, or something to, they have to see um, or, and or um, your favorite place to eat um, in the area? Oh gosh. Um, well, I think the go-to, if you're gonna get downtown DC at just some point, I would have to recommend go in the evening and do a night, an evening tour of the monuments. If, mm. Even if you've seen them during the day, if you haven't gone to the monuments at night, 
it's very cool. It's very, very cool. The, the lighting and everything is really beautiful and it's very safe right there on, on the mall. It's super safe to walk around and, um, and, and don't forget the Korean War Memorial because that often gets forgotten by people and it's very awesome, especially at night. Um, so yeah, I think just, I think that whole mall area with all the monuments is, is certainly great to see if, if somebody hasn't done that. Um, history buffs will love either Old Town Alexandria, which is very mm -hmm. colonial and has great architecture, or Georgetown. Um, same thing, just a lot of great um, old architecture and buildings and stores and restaurants. And oh, there are so many, there's just so many great restaurants. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't even think where we would begin <laughs> to recommend that. And I don't, I'm not, I've only been to the National Harbor several times, not, and it's been a lot of years since I was down there um, where the conference itself is going to be. So I honestly can't give a, a restaurant recommendation for right there, but but um, DC does not disappoint with restaurants, so. No, it doesn't. I've been to DC a few times and my I will recommend just going to like the local places. Yes, yeah. there's plenty of chains out there, but go to the local restaurants because in my opinion, those always have the best food and atmosphere. That's always so. my go-to is like, <laughs> where has the best reviews and what is like the local spot? So yeah. I'm always big into that as well. Yes, yeah, so I don't even think about going to a chain restaurant. No. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I know we're running uh, up on our time here, but I did also want to ask about your involvement with the DC Firefighter Burn Foundation, because they're actually another one of our Phoenix WBC partners. Mm -hmm. So we're so glad to have both MedStar and the um, Burn Foundation. But how are you involved in that organization? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I am probably forever indebted to the DC Firefighter Burn Foundation because of all the experiences they have en enabled me to, to participate in, starting with that first World Burn Con Congress all those years ago. Um, but no, they are an incredible group of firefighters and retired firefighters who just have a real heart for burn survivors and helping them um, in their recovery and bringing people together to, to have this peer support and to mm -hmm. just learn new skills and regain confidence and, and enjoy living. And so um, I work closely with um, Charlie Shia, who's a DC firefighter, who's also a burn survivor. And we work together on the outdoor program, um, was greatly stifled with COVID, but prior to that, we were, you know, probably every, oh, I don't know, every other month throughout the year, we would have some type of local outdoor, be that canoeing or rock climbing and hiking, that type of thing. And that was kind of a spinoff of the Burn Foundation, which sponsors us to take a group of probably five to eight patients twice a year out to the Adaptive Sports Center in Colorado. And that's for a whole week of outdoor programming. And a big piece of that is just that rebuilding of confidence and, mm -hmm. um, and then just also recognizing, you know, hey, I can do this, even despite the challenges I, I may experience or feel within my skin or whatnot, I can really do fun outdoor activities again and learn new activities. And, um, and all of that is fully sponsored by the Byrne Foundation. Um, I just, when I send out my emails regarding those trips, I say, you have to get yourself to and from the airport. Other than that, everything is, is covered by the Byrne Foundation. And then they do fund for us to bring a good, you know, 25 to 30 people every year to World Burn Congress, which, again, this is something that a lot of people would not be able to fund on their own. And so it really has a has a significant impact. Um, and I find oftentimes that our patients, they really love spending time with these firefighters. I mean, they just I think they are they feel indebted to them for doing the job that they do and helping people, you know, get out of, of these burning buildings and, and whatnot. And mm -hmm. so there's a there's a real neat relationship, I think, between firefighters and burn survivors. And but yes, they um they I, I cannot imagine anything if I were to call the foundation, you know, call Jason or Charlie or Bowie and say, hey, this is a patient who needs X, Y, and Z. Can we make this happen? And they are just 
they go above and beyond on a regular basis to just help meet the needs that, that patients have. Mm -hmm. and, and then also just really encouraging other cities um, that have burn units, if there's not a relationship with your, between the burn unit and the fire department, you know, just really encouraging that to, to make that happen because it, it's a natural connection and, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the patients benefit from that greatly. And then all the volunteers, I mean, it's great to come alongside people and to see people get better and form relationships. So it's, it's kind of a win-win, you know, for everybody. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, we're and we're so excited to have both MedStar and, you know, the D.C. Firefighter Burn Foundation partner with the conference this year. Yeah. And all being in D.C. and the National Harbor, it's going to be a really, really great event this fall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know Dr. Shop and, and Dr. Travis and Dr. Tejram, everybody's everybody's really looking forward to this. And, and the Burn team, we're trying to figure out how do we get as many people there as we can. So we're excited. Exciting. Yes. Yes. Well, right, Rebecca, I know we have just a couple of minutes and Rachel and I always ask our guests two questions. So if you've seen the podcast before, you know what's coming. <laughs> um, but um, and maybe you've already started doing your homework. Um, but what does self-care look like for Rebecca? So you see patients every day. I'm sure some of the stories can really be heavy for you. What do you do to, to help with your own self-care, um, given that you do have a, a job that does probably have some stress for you? Uh, what does that look like? Um, I think I am fortunate in that I, I live, it, well, it's only like 26 miles, but it takes an hour to drive it. Um, but I, I live in Virginia, so I have an hour drive home, which I really kind of appreciate that, to be honest. Tra traffic is not stressful to me, thank goodness. Um, but having that break of um, after work before getting home, I do kind of appreciate that. I tend to um, enjoy listening to music. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I love Adele. I love Lady Gaga. I mean, I'll just put on whatever. And, and yeah, then wow. a lot of times, it is just even I'll have a conversation with my husband or call a girlfriend. But when I get home, when the weather permits, my husband and I really like to go on a nice hour long walk. Um, mm. It's great. I, I love being outdoors. So yeah. um, being being outdoors mm. and, and getting some exercise is a nice a nice release for me, for sure. And it, it's and they're good for you too. <laughs> Walk, walking is still good, is very good for you. So that's, yes. yeah, my husband and I love that activity as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I cannot relate to the traffic stress, not stressing me out because I hate traffic and the, that <laughs> not, my, I'm lucky I work from home because I don't have to deal with traffic anymore. <laughs> but I do agree with Rebecca. I do like a nice ride in the car where I feel like I used to like listen yeah. to podcasts or things and like unless you're doing that you don't have a chance to kind of like zone out for a little yeah. bit and just use that like almost like a driving meditation right and so <laughs> um i miss that because i also work from home but uh um, yes it can yeah, be a nice buffer it can kind of be a nice mm -hmm. you know, kind of downtime buffer for sure yeah for sure well and so our final question so i know you are not a burn survivor but i wanted to ask if you've heard of maybe a unique way that a burn survivor has celebrated their burn anniversary, or if you have any ideas of how someone could celebrate a burn anniversary if they're not sure what to do. Yes. Um, I have actually been invited to some burn anniversary parties and um, I, I, I'll share the most memorable one. How about if I do that? So this, this woman, um, was a significantly large burn and it was even an assault and um, and took place in her home. And anyway, a year out from her injury, she's a remarkable human being. And a year out from her injury, her house had been, had been redone and fixed and renovated. And she just had a, I'm happy to be alive party. And she invited all of her siblings and friends. The, I mean, it was just, it was an absolutely fun, fun evening. And so remarkable that we were back in the place where the, the incident happened and that it was such a traumatic incident in and of itself. And she, um, she worked really hard physically and emotionally to be in a place where she could do that. 
And it was just a, it was a great, it was a great celebration. So she brought together the people she loved and who had played an important role in her recovery. And, and we just had a really fun evening together. That's so beautiful. And it's beautiful that as her occupational therapist, right, you had that relationship to be able to, to mm -hmm. go and celebrate with mm -hmm. her. So that's, that's really cool. And I, uh, I appreciate that because I think that is, is really special. Yeah, it was neat. I was quite honored. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Rebecca, thank you so, so much for joining Girls with Grass today. It was so great having you on the podcast. And I'm so excited to see you in person later this year. I know October may seem a while away, but this year has been flying by already. So I know it'll be here before we know it. <laughs> Yes, I agree. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. And thank you for, for all that the two of you do. Well, it was a beautiful conversation, Rebecca. And best wishes on planning the rest of that World Burn Congress. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Girls with Crafts. If you are enjoying this content, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.